entertaining, informative, and educational. Inspiring content that makes a difference. This is the Maximus Choi Publications Broadcasting Network. Join the Academy. The Breeders Academy proudly presents Bread to Perfection with Kenny Troiano. A show for serious breeders. Whether you are looking to create a new strain or simply improve an old one, you have come to the right place. Daddy, I want more chicken. <laughs> oh, boy. Now, here's your host, Kitty Triano. Well, hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of Bread to Perfection. My name is Kenny Troiano, and this, my friends, is the podcast devoted to helping you become a better breeder and taking your strain to the next level. That's right, my friends. It doesn't matter if you are brand new to breeding or you've been breeding for many years. There is something all of us can do to improve our fowl for future generations. I feel I was denied critical need-to-know information. Hey, welcome to another episode of Bread to Perfection. I'm your host, Kenny Triano, and I'm here with Mike Bradley. How are you doing? Doing good. It's supposed to be hot here, but Nancy's the one that's usually, or I'm the one that's usually complaining about the heat, and she's like, ah, this is nothing. Now, she's the one complaining about the heat, and I'm like, wow, this is nothing. <laughs> it's kind of reverse. Maybe I'm used to the heat these days. I don't think I've ever gotten used to it, or will I? It's bad here. I don't mind the temperature. The humidity is what gets me. Man, that humidity right now is just terrible. It's like my daughter, whenever she talks about the weather in Wisconsin, whenever you say it, I always feel sorry for you. It makes me appreciate San Diego, for sure. I do want to say one thing real quick. If you want to join the Breeders Academy, I'd like to invite you to do so. And there we can help you create your strains, improve your established strains, and help you get started in the right direction. Also, Bread to Perfection, which is our podcast, and we have a lot of guest speakers expert speakers. So we provide a lot of really good information. I think you'll get a lot out of it. I also want to encourage you to join my newsletter, which we call the Breeders Bulletins. You're going to get a lot of really good tips. I offer free eBooks. So make sure you don't miss those and please open them because if you don't open them, then I purge the list every so often to keep it clean. So make sure you do that. So today is going to be very interesting is on the environment. And its influences on genetic inheritance. And the environment is a huge factor. Mendelian traits, such as dominant recessive traits, are tiny compared to the environment. If you want to extend it to what we call Thomas Hunt Morgan advanced genetics, it still doesn't even compare to the environment. And then we're talking about quantitative traits, polygenic traits, which are multiple gene traits, still doesn't compare to the environment. But as you can see, all four of these work in unison, if you discard any one of those, you're going to fail. That's how important all elements together are, but it also shows you the importance of the environment as well. So let's get started. So Frank, there's a lot of confusion in this area of breeding, so much so that many breeders, they're not able to produce high quality fowl because they really miss the importance of the environment. Oh yeah. It's like you said many times, somebody can have wonderful success with a certain breeder strain and some person can come on the East coast from the West coast and buy a fowl and take it back. And they're maybe not going to have that success that guy had. Maybe they won't look the same. Maybe they'll be totally opposite of what the others are just from the environment. So going from a hot to a cold rainy to dry, like me and you, for instance, switching fowl out, my fowl would have a very rough time in your neighborhood and yours mine. It's funny you say that because Nancy and I recorded the podcast episode of this last night because it was such a good outline that I wanted to use it for both, for our podcast and the live show. And it ends up working out differently because Nancy and I discuss it the way it's written on the script for the most part, and we just have a conversation. We never know where it's going to go. But what I was going to say is 
it's funny you said that because we use you as an example quite a bit because you live in Kentucky and your mm-hmm. environment is so much different than ours in California that it's a good contrast to use. It's a good example. And so you'll see that when we put out the podcast, we use that as an example quite a bit. And, and I do believe that. I would actually tell people that when you buy, let's say I get birds from Frank and I bring them home and I start breeding them. I would tell people to expect that the offspring are going to be different. They're not going to be like Frank's just because of the environment. And the environment can include a lot of different things. But it's not so much the birds that, let's say, Frank sends to me. In this case, it's the offspring that are produced from those birds under this new environment. His birds, whatever he sends to me, is what they are. The genotype that's within the bird and the phenotype that I'm actually seeing, the observable traits, are set. They're not going to change what the bird is or what the bird is. Now, whether he survives this environment because of the climate itself and he freezes or gets hot or diseases, that's a whole different story. But the offspring he produces, that's what's going to matter. That's what's going to change. Because of the environment, it's not going to create new genes, but it's going to help express genes that you didn't even know were in your fowl. I'm going to get those birds from you and a couple of generations. I'm going to go, did you ever get this? Have you ever seen this? Never. So it's going to give the buyer or the recipient of those birds a poor indication of what is really there compared to yours. Because he's going to expect what you get, and he's not going to get that. Since social media has been out, you see a lot of this. I saw so many times where somebody would order a trio from a reputable breeder, and a couple generations into it, they'd say, well, this guy ripped me off. Yeah, My offspring is nothing like his. He sent me junk. But in reality, it's just like what we're talking about. It could possibly and more likely be the environment that they're in, the condition, the soil that they're in, the weather. So a lot can come from just environment itself. Nobody's as hard on the big breeder as I am. But you got to fight your battles. You understand which battles you need to fight. And Frank's exactly right that a lot gets blamed back to the breeder because the buyer doesn't really understand how it works. Nancy, in our conversation last night, kept wanting to bring up the fact that birds are crossed and what does that mean and the hybrid vigor that happens. And I said, that just complicates things even more because when you get those birds and they're already crosses and you look at the offspring, you don't know if the birds are pure or cross. You don't know if those traits that are being expressed are from a huge gene pool high genetic diversity, or if it's the environment. So when you're dealing with birds like that, that are hybrids, it could take you years to figure out where you're at because you don't know if it's genetic phenotype or the environment at that point. Yeah. You're in experimental stage. And not only Mm -hmm. that, when you add nutrition, of course, they're going to feed differently than another person. When you add the two together, then you're really mixing it up. You're really getting in there with the two combined. Pete brings up a good point there in that, When you're dealing with a situation like that, when you don't know if it's the environment, you don't know if the genetics, you don't know if they're pure or hybrids. This is why it's so important to create the proper environment and nutrition is a part of that. Because if you're not getting the right environment, you're not providing good environment or you're not feeding them properly, they're not going to reach their potential. And if they're not reaching your potential, then you're not going to be able to select properly. It's the whole complete package because the environment has a direct effect on the phenotype of the bird. And uh, that includes nutrition. Nutrition affects their growth and development. We're talking about disease, which can weaken the strain and even kill the ones that we care about the most, the ones think we think can take the strain to the next level. And then we're also talking about, as far as environment, poor management and stress that can affect it too. But uh, none of these factors have an effect on the strain's genotype. That's what people need to understand, that the environment has a direct effect on what's expressed, which is their phenotype. And the way you select that phenotype generation after generation is the only thing that's going to actually change the genotype. Again, we're back to making sure they have the proper environment so that we can select properly and we can direct that genotype in the right direction. That makes sense? Makes perfectly good sense because if that bird doesn't have the capabilities of reaching his full capacity, you're never going to be able to select correct anyway, whether it be environment or nutrition there's a big play in that and there's a big gap in between it, each one of them one's going to play more than the other yeah so don't judge the bird exactly on let's say if you buy a bird from frank and you live in california or you buy a bird from me and you live in kentucky 
don't base everything on what you see in the bird because that bird, that pair is going to change quite a bit over time. We should kind of highlight what we consider factors of the environment, and that is weather and climate, which can consist of the temperatures and the moisture in the air. We talked about the available feeds and nutrition, and this could be man-made feeds or mother nature, because if you're free range in them and the environment's not good, they're not going to get the proper nutrition there as well. Then there's disease and parasites, which can be different in different areas. And then there can be different strains of those diseases. Like Merrix, I think there's different variations or strains depending on where you live in the United States. Some are more virulent, more dangerous. Housing and husbandry practice. House your birds, pen your birds, free range your birds. Those are huge environmental factors. And then water quality. Not everybody has the same water quality. Out of the tap, out of the well, whether they're drinking from a river, water quality is really important. And then let's not forget about predation and wildlife. The predators, the rodents, the wild birds, they all have an effect on the environment and how well your fell grow and develop. So the question is, can we control that environment? <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. Yes and no, you know. Yeah, you can control some of it, but yeah. the weather, Mother Nature, you're just going to have to live with it. It's like me. I guess you can say people has the weather that I have. They can raise chickens in pretty much any type of weather you have to. The cold, the heat, you learn over years after years after years what works and what doesn't work. And yeah. a big part of it is learning from mistakes as far as the environment, what they do good and what they don't do good with you know it's tough especially we get a lot of rain here the last three to four years has been way above average on the rain it's just been terrible and that's a lot of things you have to look out for because some strains is going to take that better than others and that's another thing some is going to be more acceptable to weather change than other strains are well i do believe there is some things you can do you can control what you feed them you can control how you house them you can do things to prevent predation and uh, access to the wildlife. Disease prevention is all about practicing good biosecurity for the most part. It's not exactly about giving them medications. And a lot of people ask me, well, what about disease resistance? That's something that actually takes time. You don't develop disease resistance over a short period of time or a couple of years. And if I bring birds from Frank's house to mine, the resistance is going to change because of the environment too. Those are all factors that we can improve on. That's a big factor. And this has a lot to do with how domesticated animals were domesticated. We changed their environment. We provided shelter. We isolated them. We changed their nutrition, their climate, and we protected them from predation. We basically took Mother Nature out of the equation. And that's just to domesticate them. Oh, yeah. But now the thing about it is, and you're right, but it's not going to be something that happens overnight or in the first six months. It takes time. It's just like you was talking about disease resistance. We talk about this a lot and that takes time. A lot of people get discouraged and they give up, but if you do it and do it right and stick with it and hold to it in time, they will. It's just like back 20, 25, 30 years ago, the coccidiosis was terrible in this area. But as far as being resistant to it, I said, I'm not breeding any more chickens. If they get coccidiosis, I'm not breeding. And I'd done that for 25 years, not saying that I still don't get it, but it's very little. I barely get it. But if one does get sick with it, I never breed that one chicken, even if I don't cull it. We just got to stick to our guns and work out the bad to get to the good. A lot of people, I've been, almost been there myself. You'd be having problems with a particular thing going on with your chickens, coccidiosis or just anything in particular. And you get fed up with it. And a lot of people, they give up before they actually get to that phase of seeing any relief or any signs of it going up the hill again. There's a lot of work in doing something that way. And it takes a lot of patience. But it's just like with men, Stephen. He gives me his brown and reds back six, seven years ago. Now, that doesn't seem like a very long time, really. But even though it was the same blood that he's got on his yard today, the chickens are totally different. And we only live maybe 35 minutes from each other. Selection is going to be a bigger part of it. But I think soil, as far as the environment, is a big part of it. I want to go back to what Frank was saying a second ago, the Founders Program. 
And you look at the seed valve stage, it's all about trying to acquire the right genes to get started. And then after that, it's the transitional stage. And like he was saying, what you start with seems pretty good. And you will seem like you're going in the right direction for a generation or two, but you actually, whether it's the environment, disease, or just because you have such a high genetic diversity, it's going to feel like they're going in the wrong direction for a while. And that's the transitional stage. And like Frank was saying, you really do need to stick with it and learn which traits to select, which ones to call, and then just move through that. And then once you get through that, you start seeing huge progress. That first initial stage of the founders program, which is your seed stage moving into the transitional stage, is where most people quit because they think they're going in the wrong direction. They panic. They bring in new blood. If they just work through that, the rest of the transitional stage, you see huge improvement. They get better and better. Every generation's better than the last. And it's when you get into the foundation stage, they're beautiful. They got great uniformity. They're a true strain. They're predictable. As good as that is. And that's like the cream on the top. It's kind of boring, you know, because I kind of enjoy that transitional stage because you see so much improvement. You know, you're hitting the foundational stage is when you start seeing that the improvements are very subtle. But people have to understand that the environment, it does play a role. But these birds are very plastic. You can sculpt and mold them into anything you want. And when I mean plastic, I mean, like, if you look at the wild birds, People think that they're fixed in their characteristics. No, that's how new species are created. We can change them. And that environment has a lot to do with those changes you see with all the different species out there. And we can do the same thing with our birds. I look at it as the power selection. I love when people finally realize that, that they have that control to mold them like clay, like artwork. And when they finally realize that, that's the beginning of a good breeder. Once they realize that, that they can actually mold that chicken into what they actually want. They can change the confirmation. They can yep. change the type. They can change anything they want to about it. But it, they have to believe they can do that. Here's a good example. Yes. And I have this on my website. And this is without adding any outside blood. It's crazy what's in the genome that you don't even see. Because if you look at the two birds on the top, that's the pair I started with. After years of selective breeding, I created the Maximus line. And that was all through selection, looking for little things that express themselves and breeding and taking advantage of variations and exaggerating those variations. And that was all without adding outside blood. So when we're looking at the environment in the genes, the genes are already there. The environment helps express the genes that you may not even knew were there, which creates their phenotype. And that's where your selection starts. You're selecting what you can see, not what you can't see. But the genes are the genes. What they have in them is what they have in them. The environment does have an effect on the phenotype. We have to accept the fact that we're working within the confines of that environment. And it's the tools that we're going to be able to use to create our strain. And I say that all the time. I say that in my books. I say that in my articles. I say that on my website, that I could give Frank a trio or a pair. And I'd go visit him. And he would never add any outside blood. He would select them the way he wanted them. The environment would have its effect. In 10 years' time, his birds which I gave him, would look completely different than mine. And I have proof of that, too, because Tony Seville, we started with the same birds, which were originally the Colonel Givens. He got some, I got some. He got a pair, I got a pair. And his birds do look different than mine. They do. He's experiencing defects that I don't experience. I was experiencing defects on my birds that he wasn't experiencing. The environment's different in each location, and that environment's going to either disallow or it's going to express traits that we didn't even know were there that are going to yeah. be different. I don't want to lose anybody. If they don't understand the difference between a genotype and a phenotype, the genotype is an individual's collection of genes. It's the genetic constitution of the bird's genetic makeup, and most of the traits are hidden or unknown. So these are traits that are within its genome, but you can't see them, which is huge. The phenotype is the observable traits, the traits that are produced by the interaction of the genotype and the environment. In other words, these traits are the traits that we can see, and our selection points are based on the bird's phenotype rather than its genotype. I just want people to understand the difference between genotype and phenotype. All your selection is going to be based on what you can see, but as you're selecting them and you're selecting the traits that you like, inadvertently you're changing the genotype at the same time. But that takes time. And you know you're there when the birds become 
uniform and consistent and predictable. You know they've adapted to their uh, environment. At one time, a chicken was a chicken to him. They all looked the same. <laughs> and over the years, it got to where he could tell them individually. He could see different characteristics of that chicken. Now, you know that you're getting where you need to be when it's your own chickens and you're getting them confused. You can't tell one from the other. And they're your chickens. Now, it's just like parents with twins. They can look at those two kids from a mile away and tell the difference. We can't. Well, we're like that with their chickens, too. We can tell one chicken from the other, even though they look identical to other people. But when you start getting them mixed up and use the one that bred them, that's when you know you're getting where you need to be. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. This show is brought to you by the Breeders Academy, where we will help you to increase your knowledge of breeding, advance your skills as a breeder, and help you to improve the quality and performance of your fowl. As a member, I'll provide you a roadmap that you will need to create a true family or strain. Starting with a cock from one breeder and a hen from another breeder, no problem. We can help you to turn your flock of hybrid crosses or mongrels into a pure family or strain and show you how to continually improve that strain each generation. We'll start by showing you how to select your sea fowl and how to turn that sea fowl into a high quality foundation strain. Our proven breeding programs and specialty courses are designed to take you step by step through the breeding process. And best of all, I'll be there to help you every step of the way. We urge you to check it out. You have nothing to lose and you can cancel at any time. You also have a 30-day money-back guarantee. Simply go to www.breedersacademy.com to sign up. Becoming a member is a simple process. You start by selecting your membership level, enter your username, password, and email address, read and agree to the terms and conditions, then click the PayPal button. Once you have entered your payment information, you will have instant access to the website. The Breeders Academy will not only change the way you think about breeding, but improve the way you breed your fowl. One of the things Nancy kept asking me last night was, due to their environment, can traits be lost or gained? And I, I told her both. The environment has a causative factor on variation. Like we talked about, some traits, because of its environment, are going to be expressed that you didn't even know were there, and some are going to be lost. And it just takes time to develop that strain. But as soon as you move those birds to a different location, it starts all over again. Or if you bring in new blood, that's where people fell. You're never going to get birds that are adapted to their surroundings, to their environment, if you're always adding new blood. In time... It starts all over. It's like a reset. They adapt to that environment and they start over again. You move them again. The process starts again. Same thing over and over again. But you're going to see it a lot to where you was talking like me and you switching birds out. Where it's so extreme, you're going to see a lot of that. That's a good example of that too. Whenever you add new blood, you're going to start over. <laughs> what the hell did you do to my birds? <laughs> I'm never giving you birds again. You don't know what you're doing. You see it every day just by going on Facebook. Well, I got birds off him five years ago, and they started coming with white in their breasts. They started coming white, and, you know, he don't have no white. He put something else in them. He didn't sell me the right bird. You see it every day just about it. It, it could know? be the environment. It also could be the fact that they sent you crosses or sent yeah. you birds that you're crossing. That's a big factor. But I'm saying in the rare case that they may be pure, and the breeder did you well, you got to assume that the environment's going to change some things. I'll tell you, most traits that are polygenic, multiple gene traits that are measurable, they're the first to go. They're the first to be changed yeah. because some genes will thrive in certain environments and some don't. And when you have a gene or trait, actually, that's determined by multiple genes, all it takes is one gene within that trait to change it. And a lot of times that's what the complaint's about, being all short-legged or not being tall enough. Yeah. Usually that's what the complaint's about. A trait that game fowlers are very into, which is gameness, could be temperament, could be broodiness. Those all can be changed just to the fact that they've changed their location, their geographic area from what they were before. Yep. Those all play a role, the change of location. 
But what I'm seeing too, and this is where I think a lot of people fail, is they only consider, let's say, the phenotype. They don't consider the genes that are within the genome that they can't even see, and they don't even consider the environment. So they do what we call passive breeding. They accept the environment and what it's doing. They accept whatever they've got, and then they don't selectively breed on top of that. They just breed everything, and they never make progress because they're never dealing with the environment, and they're never dealing with the traits that are expressed. They're just breeding everything, and so they never make progress. Well, I couldn't imagine what you would say if me and you actually done that and they were just mongrels. Look at the change you would see then with that dramatic environment change. Now, you talk about genotypes. They'd be popping out every shape, color, defect. It would be ridiculous, really, to that, that extreme environment change. A true mongrel is a collection of a lot of different gene pools into one. But a pure family that's not selectively bred could look like a mongrel because they're throwing so many variations and they have huge genetic diversity. Yeah. If you're going to have it in a pure family, then what would it be just send somebody mongrels to that extreme difference environment? I mean, it would be crazy. Be interesting. But they'd look like uh, the old time blue families. They'd be every color, every shape, every <laughs> lake color, everything. Yeah. Or the mugs. Or the mugs. Yeah. 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 That would be another be ever color a question i get a lot is because of their environment does it create new genes and it doesn't what's in the genome is it what's in the genome and then they throw at me well what about spontaneous mutations and that's interesting because that is true a, a yeah. spontaneous mutation is a new gene basically but the truth is and this happens in the wild and also happens in domestication is most mutations are easily lost there's mutations going on all the time, not only in our chickens, but in us, and we don't even know it. So a lot of mutations can go unnoticed and lost very easily. And then the few that do arise, there's not a whole lot we can do with them or would we do anything with them. So I don't put a lot of attention or basis on mutations. Most of the time, mutations are not so much beneficial. They're more harmful than they are beneficial. And it's usually things that we would normally cull. And a lot of people, they look at mutations, and it's not even a mutation. It's actually an atavism or a throwback from a, a distant ancestor that we didn't even know about. Sometimes those genes, because of the environment, because they're in there from distant ancestors, arise because of the environment. They want to call it mutations, but it's not really a mutation. What uh, do you think mainly causes the mutated traits like split bill or been born with one leg? Would it be environment? nutrition or a bunch of things involved into one could be all of them or one of them that's why they call it spontaneous it is you yeah. never know it's not the fact that i put one bird with another these aren't genes that are in the birds it's just a mutation mutations mm -hmm. happen all the time in all living things some are detrimental they could actually kill you some are benign they're passive they're not that important some are selectively bred out of them or eliminate it due to predation because it's a trait that slowed them down or whatever. We call them because they don't look right. One of the mu mutations I see mostly, and it's spontaneous, is a sport, a white sport. And most people don't take advantage of the white sports properly. They breed them to everything, <laughs> you know what I mean? Because if they took a white sport and bred it to another white bird, they could actually create white birds. That's how we got white birds in the first place. Mm -hmm. All these white leghorns, Genetic they're originally... Mutation. Yeah, it was a mutation yeah. mm -hmm. and they took advantage of it. I get that so often. I see people and, and I've said it, I don't know how many times people says there's no such thing as a white round head. There's no such, such thing as a white kills. The thing about it is any family can, if, if that mutated gene arrives, you can get white in any color. Yeah. You know, Frank, I, I agree with what you're saying, but mm -hmm. my caveat would be that if I got a white out of my hatch, and I wanted to breed whites, I wouldn't call them hatch at that point. I would just call them white, whatever. That's how I would handle that. That's what confuses people when you say, oh, I've got this white Kelso or I've got this white roundhead. The veterans would tell you that's not a Kelso, but it just confuses things. A Kelso, if we stay to the truth of what we've always known Kelso to be or hatch, was a specific confirmation of body. It was a specific color of plumage. And in, in some cases, it was their performance ability. Those things all went out the window a long time ago. Yeah. They're not the same Years confirmation, ago. not the same color, not the same performance ability. And they don't match. It just doesn't even exist anymore. 
got to get away from the name game and the uh, percentage game, or we're never going to get ahead of, of all this. The only way that they could actually survive is if the breeder was still currently breeding. If that breeder's been dead for years, we should have dropped those names a long time ago. Exactly. I really believe ago. that. We're putting a stress on the environment to induce a genetic response. And that's the whole name of the game here. Okay, that brings up a question because Nancy kept drilling me on this last night. Stress. Can we look at that as an environmental factor? Stress by itself. Is that considered an environmental factor? Is that going to induce a genetic response? And stress comes from disease, right? Especially when you live in a climate like we do, if you get too much rain, your fowl's not used to too much rain. That could very well happen. But one day it can be sunny and beautiful here and hot and muggy, and the next day be cold and wet and totally opposite of what it is from day to day. But regardless of where you live, even if it is in paradise, Kenny. Weather's weather. Yeah, weather's, weather's weather. weather. You can complain I live in paradise, but weather's still weather. I call it weather. One day it's cold, one day it's hot. One day it rains. That chicken sees, say, 80 degrees, a nice breezy day one day, and then the next day it drops down into like 63. That's cold to that chicken. Yeah. Even enough, that's going to stress it. Doesn't matter how cold it is, it's what that chicken is uncomfortable with. That's right. Know? What it's used to. Exactly. Yeah. Paradise or not. Yeah. One of the questions I get a lot is genetic triggers. Can that be a environmental thing? Is that something that can be generated because of an environment? And I believe it is because we were talking about Tony Seville and his birds came from my birds. Well, I never heard him complain because there was a time when the tails would come out after the molt, they would be twisted. Have you ever seen that where the primary tail feathers are actually twisted? And I thought it was going to ruin my strain. And I culled all the ones that showed it. I culled the females that produced it, culled the offspring. It seemed to be centralized in one of the lines, not all of them. And it, I got a handle on it and it hasn't returned since. Well, Tony, he's never complained about that with his birds. And I've heard other people say the same things that they had birds in one location, they moved them to another. All of a sudden things that seemed like latent triggers were showing up that they weren't showing before. So I, I really do believe that although triggers are genetic and most of the time be expressed because it is a trigger, the environment can play a role in genetic Thank triggers. You. And more on one than others, I think, too. It can really have effect more on others. Uh, yeah, it's not guaranteed. Yeah, it's not guaranteed. No. I'm just saying that if they have a tendency for that particular trait and the weather is favorable for that to be expressed, it's going to be expressed. It's going to induce that genetic response, definitely. I'm glad you mentioned that on the twisty fact because I've not had it in some time, but I have had that before. Have I you? I sure have, yeah. Yeah, sure that's have. a pain in the butt because... Latent triggers are terrible because you don't know about them until the bird gets older. And then in the meantime, he's produced a lot of offspring and you're going to be fighting that forever. Um, the other thing would be genetic correlations of traits and the environment. And, and this is true. I, I, I searched this thing and I checked the science on it. And it's a big factor in that because of the environment, it changes one trait. And that also has a correlation on changing another trait at the same time. And when I looked it up, this is what the books showed me. And I've seen this actually. Length of kill and body weight, they're correlated. And that can be induced by the environment. Let me know if you've seen this too, any of these. Body weight and the number of eggs laid. We see that yeah. all the time. That can be induced because of the environment. It could be nutrition too, too much food, whatever. Heat and broodiness. In hotter areas, they tend to be less broody. Have you seen that where you guys are, where you see when it gets hot, they're less broody? And they also said they could actually lose that trait. It really differs for mine. I've had them this year go broody, take the chicks away, and two days later, they're not broody anymore. But do they stay? Is it a permanent thing? They say it can be a permanent thing. Well, from year to year, it can be different, I think, at least with mine. You take a, a hen, do it for a week, one time, and two months for the next. So mine, it really depends. I really never thought of it that way, Kenny. To be honest with you, I, I yeah. really never thought of it. This other one seems like something that would be, well, a lot of these are. I mean, they occur during the growth and development of the bird. And if it's leaning towards one trait, it's going to produce a difference in the other traits like this one here. Size of body and structure and conformation. That definitely can yeah. change it. And uh, growth and development can be many things which are all related to environment. It could be the weather. It could be nutrition. It could be how you're raising them. That can all affect growth and development. And that will 
change their structure and conformation of body. Size of body and poor bone density. I've seen that a lot, which the first indications of poor bone density is crooked breastbone. I get tired of hearing people saying, oh, it's nothing. It was caused by the roost. So my birds are in some of the sharpest roosts you'll ever see, and they do not have crooked breastbone. That crooked breastbone, it may be the roost that caused the crooked breastbone, but it's the genetics that allows it to happen. And when you're seeing crooked breastbone, that's showing you that you're seeing poor bone density throughout the body. You're just seeing it in the breastbone. I don't like it when people say, oh, it's just a roost. It may be causing it, but it's the genetics that are allowing it to happen. Why didn't his siblings do that? Why didn't the brother and sisters do the same exact thing, you know? Well, sometimes they do. (laughs) <laughs> uh, I really think genetics has a part in that, but I also think too high a percentage of it can be nutrition as yeah. well. Let's assume that they're feeding them properly. And you're seeing crooked breastbone. They're only like five, six, seven months old. To me, I would call that bird. And this could be the environment. This could be the molt. This could be nutrition. If I'm seeing a crooked breastbone in an older hen, I might allow that because she might have got behind in calcium which would create that crooked breastbone. And when she brought her calcium levels back up, it left the crooked breastbone. So if I'm checking my birds properly and I'm keeping an eye on that thing, but I'm only seeing in a handful of my older hens, I might allow that. It's like Frank was saying, if you're seeing it in some birds, but not others, and I'm looking at that as a genetic issue because genes are different in each bird, even in siblings, they're going to be completely different. So, Well, too, Kenny, even if it is nutritional, I don't want to chance it. There's no way that I could prove is either or. So if it's a young bird and it does have a crooked breastbone, I get rid of that bird. I, I don't take any chance on it because even though you're thinking, well, it could have been nutrition. It could have been like the old saying, they went on the roost before they was supposed to. And that's what made it crooked. I don't take that chance. I don't want down the road for it to end up biting me. And it won't bite you as soon as you breed them. It's going to be three, four years down the road. And then that's when it's going to hit you. So it's best not to chance it. Another question I get is, can the environment show you the traits that are important, which is an interesting way of putting that, but Mm -hmm. the environment will show you the traits that can be expressed under that environment. And it's usually the same traits that help it survive in that environment at the same time. Are they important? Those are important. And it's us, the breeder. It's different in the wild. We've basically taken Mother Nature out of the equation, and we're selecting the traits we like. We're calling the ones we don't like. And the environment's going to show us, a lot of times, which ones need to be selected and which ones need to be called. So the question is, how do we improve our strains? How do we take the effects of the environment and use them in our favor in the selection and improvement of our strains? I think it's free-ranging. If you take the offspring of your fowl, and you put them in a confined area. They grow up in cages. And then you take another clutch of brothers and sisters and you let them free range. That's going to be totally different. From the ones that free range from the ones that didn't have that freedom to get out, scratch in the woods, you dig up insects, bugs, worms, grubs. They're going to be totally different. They're going to be superior to the ones that didn't. So environment can play a big part of that just and peer development of uh, each individual. Frank's right, but everybody's environment's different. Not everybody can free range like Frank. True. They stay in my yard. Oh, yeah. But this time of year is a little tougher because there's not a lot of grass out there. The environment's a little bit different. We have grass six months out of the year, then it dies off and it's all dirt. I'm not saying they can't find anything, but if I had too many birds free ranging, that could be a problem. Yeah. I think one of the ways to use the environment to our favor is to understand gene frequency, understand that the number of genes of a particular trait or a number of birds carrying that particular trait is what's important. And it shows us the direction that the family wants to go in. I would concentrate on the gene frequency. Gene frequency. It's the occurrence and frequency of a particular gene or trait. And some birds, if you're looking at a family that has a lot of genetic diversity, you're going to have a low gene frequency. If you have a family that's more pure and more predictable and the results are more predictable, you're going to have a high gene frequency. And that's what you want. But you look for the pattern. And if you're dealing with a certain environment and you get some birds, hopefully they are pure and they're not crossed. 
and you're seeing a pattern of uh, certain birds or a number of the birds carrying more of a particular trait than others, then sometimes that's telling you something. That's telling you that's the, kind of the direction you want to go in. So what about progeny testing? The offspring, they prove the worth of the parents, right? They never lie. Without doing that, trait could really be lost in one breeding. Really. It's so important. But without testing the progeny, you're guessing, really, Kenny. You're guessing is all you're doing if you're not testing the progeny. The progeny are going to show you what the environment's doing to that family. It's like Tony used to tell me, they never lie. They nope. tell you exactly what you need to know. They prove the worth of not only themselves, but their parents. Right. But understand that the environment and the way it affects your family, and this is where I think it's most important, is when you're getting a bird from, let's say, Frank or someone else, look at the uh, birds that you're getting, whether you know they're pure or whether they're cross or you're not sure either way as seed fowl. And they're just the beginning of your strain because I can guarantee you due to whatever they're carrying in their genome, whatever the genetics are carrying, whatever phenotypically you can see and the environment, I can guarantee you down the road, generations down the road, they're going to be completely different. They're not going to be what they were with that other breeder for various reasons. And you just need to accept that. But if you understand the proper confirmation, the proper type, the proper color, the proper temperament, and you know how to select them, you have that knowledge to select them properly, you can create a family that you like. That's why I'm, I always say, get rid of the name game. Get rid of the percentage game. They really mean nothing. If you're caught up on that, you're caught up in that hamster wheel that you're never going to get out of. And you're, you're fooling yourself. I don't care what anybody says. They mean nothing. Only thing they mean is confusion. You're buying into a false. It's yep. the peddler's playground and you're falling for it. Yep. It really is. You don't think these peddlers don't know this? <laughs> they know yeah. it. I'm telling you. They're getting rich from it. That's like Tony was saying, he was going to the auction, seeing these same guys, these big names buying birds at the auction to fill an order that he couldn't fill on his own. He doesn't know what those birds are. He's just calling them whatever. Just because they look the part. Beginners are getting fooled every day. And yeah. this name game and this percentage game is hurting everybody. It means nothing. I'll tell you, you can learn so much with just take them home, breed them. And that's pretty much going to tell you a lot about what the offspring you get out. If they're different weights, different shape, different colors, then you know you bought pretty much crosses. If you breed them and they're all the same, at the same, which that's going to be one out of a million if that ever happens. They're all identical, a true family. You're going to know. But that first breeding is going to tell you a lot. It's going to tell you a huge amount about what you have. If you see they all come out the same leg color, the same confirmation, type, plumage color, then you can sit there and go, hmm, I may have something here. <laughs> you know what I mean? But if you're looking at offspring, all the offspring have different comb types, leg colors, confirmation, feather color, then I can guarantee you that you got crosses. And uh, when you call the guy back and say, hey, you know, I'm getting a variety of different colors, leg colors. Oh, they're like that. They come that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you some more just like it. You know what he'll say? That's because we got a little bit of hatch in them. They got three quarters Kelso, quarter hatch, and then down the road, I put roundhead in them too. But they're a family. They're a really good family, solid family. They've been doing well for me. I'm a big breeder's worst nightmare, ain't I? <laughs> <laughs> they're pure. I just freshed them up every five, four, yeah, five Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every five or six years, I put new blood in them because they're getting a little inbred. And, mm -hmm. and we're, we're saying this jokingly, but seriously, that's usually oh, the, what you get. This stuff frustrates me so bad. I'll tell you to the point where I was, I guess you could say a member of a lot of Facebook groups. I couldn't even tell you how many of them. And yesterday I was going through my Facebook, kind of looking at pictures and I didn't find one bird, one American game that represented its breed that I was like, wow, they were all junk. And I told myself last night, and this is before I went to bed, I says, I've had enough of this. I went and deleted almost every one of my group pages. I know because that. I am tired of seeing this. I'm so tired. It's hurting my brain. It's frustrating that people are getting on there and saying, wow, look at my feed. It's really pretty. And it's the most incomplete ration I've ever seen. Or look at my birds. It has this and this. I've never seen the structure of a bird so badly. And everybody's on there. Wow, that's the best bird I've ever seen. Hundreds of comments on how good his bird is. So I just start deleting all these pages. <laughs> you know what I mean? I start getting rid of all of them. I can't, I can't take this anymore. You've been doing that for a while now. Because I've noticed one by one. You was going off, so you must just finish it off. I got night. rid of a whole bunch of them last night. <laughs> Joe, come on over. Give me a beer, man. I need a beer. I need to be calmed down, you bet. 
if they knew what they were doing, they're basically yeah. just shooting their own self in the foot, what they're doing. They, they don't know any better. You go to the Breeders' Academy. You're never treated badly there. Those there people go. want to learn. That's true. I, I've made up my mind a long time ago. And although I fall into it every now and then, and I always regret it, is I don't make a comment or respond to anything unless they ask me directly. I don't do that anymore. I just don't. And that's why I like the Breeders Academy because I'm in there to answer all their questions and they're always really good questions and it really works for me. You know, I got one more topic to cover real quick. So the question is, does the hen have an influence on her offspring separate from genetics? And they do. And it's called the maternal environment. A brooder can be considered the maternal environment too, as well as a broody hen. The environment that you provide for her to raise her chicks in or the brooder, the environment of the brooder to raise the chicks in is going to have an effect on their growth and development and how they mature, their overall quality. So if you've got a hen that's in there and don't have a lot of room and kicking dirt all over the place and creating a poor environment for those chicks, their environment's going to actually make it so they don't grow and develop properly. And the same thing with brooder. Okay, so you have that. That's an important factor to consider. But there are also some hens that are just more active than others that no matter what you do, they're going to create a poor environment too. So you need to know how to do that. And those hens, the only way to deal with them is to let them free range. But then you have the environment, the actual environment that can have an effect on them too, as well as predation. Have you heard of that before, Frank, the maternal environment? No, something similar. Well, I don't know if there's another name for it, but the books yeah. I was pulling up on genetics and the environment, this is what they were calling it. Yes. This is from multiple books. They also talked about our role in it as well as a breeder. The conditions yeah. that we provide for her play a big role in that too. Yeah. I think temperament has a lot to do with that, but the hen has to have a somewhat good environment that we put them in. Now, if we let them free range, we know there's going to be predators. We know there's going to be the weather that takes effect. But if we got them in a nice pen, we can keep them warm, dry, good conditions in a controlled area that way. But I get what Kenny's saying, and it can be good or bad conditions that we ourselves put them in to start with. Karen, do we have any questions or comments that we can respond to? Or do we need to start wrapping it up? First of all, why are you worming them? What makes you think you need to worm them? Most people worm birds when they don't even need it. So unless you have proof that you need to worm, whether you've done a flotation test, a fecal flotation test, or you're actually seeing worms in the droppings underneath the roost, or the birds are extremely light and there's no other explanation, I wouldn't worm them. That's the first thing I got to say right there. Have they been on the ground? Has their feet even touched the ground? That's a big part of it. When you see a loss in the breast muscles like that, you really ever get it back. And it would take a long time. Also, Let's say it's not genetic because it very well could be genetic. Is he providing good fresh water all the time? Is he providing the proper feed? There may be another reason why he's getting a poor breast on the birds. Is it something he's seen both in the roosters and the hens? Is he properly raising them and giving them proper nutrition during the growth and development stage? There's a lot to be unpacked there. He might be a member of the Breeders Academy. If he gets a hold of me inside the Breeders Academy, I can give him a link. He can send me pictures. I can take a look at him. And maybe I can make a better determination of what's going on there. But you're right with that, Kenny. Usually if it's a severe case of the hatchet breast, it's impossible to get rid of. And like Kenny said, with that hatchet breast, the bone's sticking through all the meat, pretty much. Uh, that bone doesn't have any meat on it. And uh, like Kenny said, he's 100% right. That could be a deep the, breast, could be a pointed breast. Exactly. Or he could have a good breast on it, but he just has a really deep kill. It could be numerous things. Yep. It could well, I look at it from the genetic side, but I do also look at it from the nutrition side because like right now we're talking about the environment. I think nutrition has a big part of the environmental factor. Yeah. And that's an important muscle. That, that's the most important muscle on the bird, actually. Mm -hmm. That's going to give power to the wings and allow the wings to work properly. That breast muscle is everything. Mm -hmm. And with a hen, when you got your hatchet breast it destroys them trying to hatch eggs yeah uh, see that's a trait that usually takes care of itself because those hens rarely uh, well here's a question does he use the hen to hatch the eggs or does he use the incubator because i can guarantee you if he's using the hen he's probably not getting a great hatch rate yeah because they mm -hmm. can't sit on them it's either on the left or the right and that breast yeah. sits down on the ground it won't allow eggs to be under it yeah definitely 
Okay, Karen, anything else? The environment in which they're raising makes a big deal. But let me say this too, because I don't want people hearing that and getting too carried away. Because if you create an environment that's too clean, you create other problems. They really need to be exposed to the microorganisms in their environment to become immune to the elements of their environment. So I wouldn't say to clean it like spick and span all the time. Most of the calls I get from local feed stores around here, they're having problems with their birds because they keep their environment too clean. Now, with that being said, you can look at your environment, you can look at your pens and determine what's too clean and what's too dirty because you obviously don't want to go the other way. I'm glad to hear he's seen a good result and everything's working really good, but I don't want people thinking that they need to over clean everything all the time. That can be worse than that can be worse. severely dirty. Yeah. yeah. I, I see so many times people that will cup feed like we do, Kenny. Yeah. And then they'll sell or give somebody chickens. They take it home and they start dashing the feed in the pen on the yeah. ground. I used to do and the then same the thing. Sick. I used to, my theory was I would just throw the feed in the pen, let them dig for it. To me, they were getting exercise. The reason I was uh, cup feeding was because the rain, but a lot of people would just go in and throw their feed right in that mud, right in the feces yeah, but, of the chicken and everything. With game fowl breeders, a lot of them, they only give them feed enough to what they're going to eat, what one eating. But overfeeding in this area, I've noticed people, botulism is terrible yeah. in this area. They'll feed them, overly feed them, the feed moles, they eat it, they get sick. Then they think, first thing out, oh gosh, my chickens has got Merrick's disease. And everybody tell them it's Merrick's disease. You see that so often. Most of the time, they're either dragging a leg or dragging a wing or both. Well, you'll see it in the eye or something like that. And usually they'll have severe weight loss, too. Uh, well, because they're not eating. They can't get to the food. Eating, yep. Yep. They try. They just can't do it. Like I said, Boya, I'm pretty sure he's a member of the Breeders Academy. So I want to encourage him to go into the Breeders Academy and read the course on inbreeding. That'll show him the pros and cons and all about inbreeding. But I don't want him to confuse or to associate the environment so much with the inbreeding process because we're talking about two different things there for the most part. Inbreeding is a great tool. So he's saying like going really deep into inbreeding. And I wouldn't look at it like that. I would use it the way it is in the founders program. It's used for a specific reason to achieve a specific purpose and result. And it's a great tool, but it's not what I would call a breeding method. And it basically gets you from the seed stage to the foundation stage quicker and allows you to make better progress faster. So I don't want to go too deep into this. He just may have a little misunderstanding of inbreeding. But if you go into the Breeders Academy and read the course on inbreeding, and if you still have questions, contact me inside the Breeders Academy and we'll walk, I'll walk you through it. We can even do a coaching call on it if you like. Yeah, there'd be a lot of questions I'd have to ask on that. Is it already made family? Is it a cross? That, you know, what he's starting with is seed fowl. And more or less, what's the reason he's wanting to do a brother to sister mating? That's very yeah. important. You don't do it haphazardly. Exactly. There has to be a good reason to do it to achieve a specific purpose. Yeah. And usually it's something that's somewhat in the beginning of a breeding program, but it's done a certain way. You just don't do a brother and sister mating. It has to be done properly. If you're using it in an established family, my question would be, why would you do that? Are you seeing a lot of genetic diversity? Are they not uniform? What are you seeing that makes you think you need to do an inbreeding like that? Is it the only bird you have? That's a bigger discussion. Maybe we'll yeah, cover and, it. Uh, and that's a very important breeding too. Very, very important. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people are afraid of it. But if you understand how to do it properly and why you're using it, then it's a great tool. It really is. But the way Kenny has it set up in, in the Breeders Academy he has it fixed for creating your own strain or yep. improving traits in already existing family. So yeah. th there's a lot of questions that has to be answered before actually d doing the brother to sister mating. Very vague what he's asking. I know he's trying to combine the um, environment into a breeding method, especially brother and sister mating. I wouldn't do that. Let's put it this way. If you don't have a handle on the environment and you don't have a handle on what you're dealing with within the genome and their phenotype, you shouldn't be doing a inbreeding. There's some things that have to happen before you get to that point anyways. That's true. Anything else, Karen? If you're bringing a bird from one area to another, there's always going to be a certain amount of adjustment and you're going to have to learn what to select and when. Well, just like here in Kentucky, a lot of people comment and they'd say, why do, is breeders in Kentucky, they all have good looking fowl? And I think because of the environment, the weather, 
harsher weather, the colder winters, nature really does a lot of culling on its own, even with predators. The strong survives. And I think the environment helps build a better bird that way. Yeah. Mother nature should play a role in your selection. And if you're letting them free range, you're allowing her to do that. And I do agree that birds that are raised under a harsher environment and selectively bred have an easier time in somewhere where it's not as harsh. But they would have other elements that might affect them too. Could be disease. Diseases they weren't exposed to before. So there's always an element. Every environment's different. All birds are different and they're going to react differently. And how they react to the environment will determine which genes are going to be expressed. And then you select from there. They can be raised and uh, bred and selectively improve in the harshest environment or the best environment. It's, it's up to you. You have to mold and sculpt that bird and uh, select them in a way that they will survive that environment. And I, I've never seen this where you have an environment where they're never exposed to disease, never exposed to climate, and they have the best of conditions. I actually think in some ways you may be raising a pretty weak bird because as soon as you take that bird somewhere else, it's going to affect it really quickly. And maybe why some birds go to a different location, they die right off the bat. It may be, too, that if I were to send birds to Frank in Kentucky, because he's always telling me his weather, I don't know how he even survives that weather, my birds might not do very well there where his birds would probably be in heaven. So who knows? You never know. But I, I would bet if mine come out your way, there's going to have just as hard a problem as yours here, I would imagine. Well, you never know. The weather you talk about there, we don't experience here. Yeah. You know? Mm -mm. Yeah. Well, I will say this. If any strain can live and do good in Kentucky... Can live anywhere, huh? They, I think they could live anywhere, <laughs> unless you get up in Antarctica or somewhere there. But yeah, I believe they could live just about anywhere they wanted to in the country. I really see do. some breeds, even domestic breeds, are bred like some of the ones that were created in the northern states were heavier meat birds with bigger plumage. They were selectively bred to survive that particular environment. If you were to take that bird and send it to the south, it may not do very well. And if you were to take a bird that was created in the south and take it up north and have to deal with the snow and the cold, it might not do very well. But if you were to selectively breed the ones that were adapting properly, you could actually create a really strong strain eventually. So, yeah, it can be done. Did we thoroughly confuse that guy or not? <laughs> <laughs> Is he a member of the Breeders Academy? Because I have a whole list of books that he can purchase or he can find on Amazon.com, eBay, all kinds of places. I don't even know how many books there are. Have you ever? That's what I was going to recommend. Yeah, I have a huge yeah, library of books. Most of them I have here. And so I would actually go there. And if he's a, a member of the Breeders Academy, he can contact me and we can talk about those particular books because I could be here all day. Thomas Shaw's book is an older book. It's all in animal breeding, but very much applies to chickens in ma many ways. Don't be shy about books that say animal breeding because they do address poultry. And a lot of the principles and practices do work for poultry as well. Morally, all his books are on domestic chickens and commercial chicken raising. He has a great series on breeding, which I have and I love. Great books. He has a number of books on successful poultry raising, production, science and practices. He's got, like I said, the three on breeding. I love those books. I have a, a really big collection and I'd have to go through them and tell you them all. But I've got some on genetics. I have a lot on not only animal genetics, but I have a lot on poultry genetics. I have a lot of books on animal breeding, poultry breeding, biology, evolutionary biology. Those kind of books are great. They give you a good insight on breeding and genetics and all the things we're talking about today. So I could be here all day talking about books. Yeah, I'm not going to be prejudiced or anything, not trying to be, but Kenny has got a great book. My book's available on Amazon.com, and it's a great book on the introduction of breeding. It'll get you started in the right direction. It just doesn't have breeding programs, and it touches on breeding methods, but it doesn't have the breeding programs. It doesn't have the founders program. But the Breeders Academy goes way deeper on those topics, and there's a lot more in the Breeders Academy. The book is really good, the blue book on breeding. Um, yeah, it's wonderful. It's a good book to get started. I just think the website's 100 times better. That's all. Yeah, the website's more involved. It goes way deeper and the way it's explained too. It's laid out in a way you can actually use it where the book yes. kind of just helps you understand a few things. You know? But now it's got some great illustrations in the book as well. It doesn't have the great videos book. and audios. Okay, 
I have some roosts out there that are flat. I have some that are round and I have some that are pointed and I don't have crooked breastbone. I will say this though, the roost can cause the bird to have a crooked breastbone, but it's the genetics that allows it to happen. It could be nutrition. Nutrition does play a role in crooked breastbones, but I'm going to assume that you know how to feed your birds properly. And then you're keeping an eye on them and raising them and getting them through the growth and development stages properly. But if you're doing all that properly and you're still getting crooked breastbone, it's genetic. Because what that's showing you is poor bone density. What you're seeing in the breast is just an indication of what's going on throughout its whole body. And the more crooked that breastbone is, the more po poor bone density you're going to see within the body, which means brittle bones, broken bones. I would suggest that you cull the birds that have crooked breastbones, breed to the ones that don't. If you have a whole flock that has crooked breastbone, you look for the lowest intensity for that particular trait, and in time you can improve it. It's a polygenic trait, quantitative trait, measurable trait. And if you're breeding and selecting for the intensity or less intensity of that trait, you can actually improve it. But if you're seeing birds that don't have crooked breastbone, I would cull those crooked breastbones and don't breed to them. I would not chance it. Even though if yeah. I did think it was nutrition, I just wouldn't. I wouldn't either. Try it, guys. Look at it from a nutritional standpoint, but I have to look at it as a genetic standpoint. And nutrition can be fixed. Genes, if it's there, it can't be fixed in that particular bird. He will pass that trait. He or she will pass that trait. Yeah. And once it gets in there, two or three years down the road, you're going to be mm -hmm. destroyed. That's all you're yeah. going to have. Stay on top of it. Stay on top of it. I'm with Frank. If you see it, get rid of it because yeah, it's, it's just not worth it. chancing. Yeah, you it's know? not worth chancing. It's going to catch up to you later. And if the genetics are right and you're feeding them properly, I don't care how pointed that roost is, you're not going to see a crooked breastbone. I don't see it in my yard. People can blame that on the roost all day long. But I will say this, Craig Mave came in late because we talked about this earlier. And the only time I would give this a, a pass would be hens that I knew weren't crooked earlier but they're older in age and they've went through the molt and their calcium levels change all the time and they have to replenish those during the molt. And if they get crooked breastbone because they got behind in calcium, that would be a whole different story, you know, especially hens that lay a lot of eggs, but not so much game fowl, not so much game fowl. I don't think sure. that would be an issue with game fowl. Well, and a lot of times, Kenny, the ones that we see in game fowl, they're more of a S type men. They have that U in the breast. Or they're bent over or something. Or they're, they're yeah. angled, yeah, off keel, yeah. more or less, off camber. But the ones that actually have the indention in it, I've seen that, but it be permanent, that, that it, it would go away. What a discussion, but did a good job, I think. Covered it really well. I think we opened up some eyes, made some people think a little bit. Hopefully they're gonna consider the environment from now on. So, I wanna thank everybody for joining us. We do this for you. I really appreciate the comments and the questions. I want to thank Frank again for joining me and making this a nice discussion. I want to thank Karen for producing the show in the background and making my job a whole lot easier. <laughs> okay, so we'll see you guys next week. See you guys. Okay, thanks for listening. Yes, thank you again for joining us on the Bread to Perfection podcast show. This show was brought to you by the Breeders Academy where by becoming a member, you can increase your knowledge of breeding, advance your skills as a breeder, and take you and your fowl to the next level. We can also show you how to create a strain from hybrid crosses or mongrel flocks and help you to create, maintain, and improve your present strains. We urge you to check it out. You have nothing to lose and you can cancel anytime. To join us at the Breeders Academy membership website, go to www.creatorsacademy.com Best of all, I'll be there to help you every step of the way. While you're checking out the Breeders Academy, make sure to sign up for our newsletter, The Breeders Bulletin. We provide a lot of free bonus materials and some great information that will take you and your fowl to the next level. Well, that's it for now. We hope you join us next time for another episode of Bread to Perfection. We'll see you later. Bye.